Center Committee. And this meeting is recorded for every for everyone to know. Uh, the, I'm Hina, the uh, co-chair of Venture Committee and the RISD Founders and Entrepreneurs Affinity Group. And very happy to present the second workshop on um, uh, the angel investing and fundraising side. And very honored to have, this is also very honored to have Brooke Harley to join us the second time. And welcome, Brooke. And Thank you. Mm, it's so lovely to have you. And your first workshop, we received so many positive feedbacks. <laughs> Good. And it's Angel Investing 101. And so very happy to have you back. Very honored to have you today. And people, our alumni mentioned that how they're very impressed by how informative and how effective your information are. And they continue to follow you even after the class, actually. And I'm very and happy that... Yes, our alumni could get the support and the help they need. And so today, Fundraising 101 um, is for the support entrepreneurs. And it's also a workshop to support the RISD pitch event that will happen later this year. And, and so Brooke is uh, the founder and uh, CEO of Class Rebel, and she uh, has been a serial entrepreneur, angel investor, so has been uh, uh, experience and education on, on both sides. And also she very special, she has a lot of education as well. And Class Rebel is based in New York. And the concept is to, to offer highly affordable and highly relevant live, uh, live stream courses taught by uh, aspirational industry experts. And it's a very new revolutionary model um, to revolutionize the uh, e-learning space. Mm, and I would love to give it to Brooke and to let you also share more about yourself with our audi audience. And before that, I would love to also uh, mention Daniel. Uh, Daniel here. Uh, Daniel is the alumni relations officer that works behind the scene that help us to put this together. Very grateful to all your support. Thank you. And now I will give it to Brooke. All yours. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, guys. It's an honor to be here. Um, welcome everyone to Class Rebels Fundraising 101 mini class. I'm Brooke Harley. I'm going to be your instructor and your spiritual guide for the next hour. We're going to get you guys five years ahead. Uh, we're going to teach you five things um, to get you five years ahead in what you know about raising money. Uh, we know your time is precious. We won't even waste one minute of it. Um, and we're going to get you five years ahead tonight. Before we start, I do want to share my background with you uh, and also share with you that we do these classes, uh, the mini class and our full class, live, spicy, interactive. I'm going to tell you my background. But if we've got, you know, two or three people that are willing to say hello um, share, a, share with us a little bit about what they're building, if they've started their pitch deck yet, if they've talked to investors. Uh, I'd love a couple of introductions because sometimes we can use that experience in class to make this more real. So I'll share my background with you guys. Um, I started off as an m and attorney. I don't know if there's any, uh, anyone here who had a love affair with the law, but I did for a number of years, left and did my MBA. Uh, and I came out of that, that class in the Great uh, Recession, um, and I got a job, you guys, but barely. I um, chased around the CFO of Lululemon until he would give me a job, uh, and he did. And on my way in, I negotiated uh, for as many stock options as I could. And in Fundraising 101, in our full course, we learn a lot about stock options. Uh, I used to draft stock option plans for a living, very sexy, I know, but it made me, uh, it helped me understand them. And it's something as founders, you guys actually have to understand too, because you're going to be giving them out to attract talent. Um, you know, when that happened, um, Lululemon was at the bottom. It was trading at $10 a share and over three years, it increased 800%. And so I started, I had a windfall and I started to think about, well, what if I could find the next Lululemon before it went public? Um, you know, what if I can find the next, you know, Lululemon as a startup when nobody knows about it? And that was really my entry into venture. And there was no courses back then. I sort of had to figure out all this, you know, complicated stuff. Um, and then I raised, I went, uh, did my first investment was um, 
Native Shoes, which if there's any parents on the phone, you might know this company is bankrupt when I invested in it. It um, is now the number one selling kids shoe on Zappos. And from there, I left Lululemon and I raised uh, a $32 million fund. I raised it with a bunch of partners. We were covered in the press. It took two years, you guys. And then uh, this story takes a dark turn. Uh, Then the partners fought and it actually came apart. And to put something positive in its place, I started to teach uh, fundraising 101 and angels 101 because it doesn't take you long uh, when you're on the investment side of it. It does not take you long to figure out who's, who controls capital um, and who it's getting risked on. And I saw pretty fast that it was, you know, barely any money at all was going to women and people of color. And I thought, you know what, let's get, let's get some education out on this. I don't think it fixes bias, but it can help. It can help people feel really confident in what's going on. And I started teaching, uh, people started joining from around the world, and it gave me a much bigger idea about modern education in this hundred year life. Uh, So moved to New York, was offered a term sheet by a VC within weeks of pitching. And I actually, I I share more in the full class, I actually turned it down. Um, And I, I closed a bit of angel money instead. So I share all that experience with you guys to tell you that I've seen this from all the angles, from an angel investor, from a GP of a fund and a founder, I know how tough this is. Um, And if you learn some of these principles, um, you are so much better set up uh, to raise money because you'll be more confident in in how you're carrying yourself. Uh, Can we get everyone on mute? Is that okay? Um, uh, I just heard a bit of background noise. Thanks for that. So I want to share that experience with you. Uh, I've had some, I've, I've won some and I've lost some, you guys. Um, and I think I have, you know, more than 10 years experience that can help you guys learn this fairly quickly. So I'm excited to do that tonight. But before we start, I'm wondering if there's anyone on the phone that's willing to say hi, tell us what you're working on. Have you had experience pitching investors yet? Uh, have you started uh, your materials? If there's anyone willing to say hi, I'd love to hear from a couple of you. I'll hand it over to you guys. Is there anyone? I'll be, oh, I'm open to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. All right, hang on one sec. Um, and I have to put my children to bed in a few minutes, so um, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> um, so I'm, my name is Aviva Gaskell. I'm a clinical psychologist, um, and I graduated from RISD in 04 in illustration. Um, Sorry, my heart is like pounding because I've never actually like shared this idea outside of really like the therapy world before. It's good practice. Thank you for doing it. <laughs> so try to overcome my fear here. So um, I, um, I, my background is in health psychology, but mm-hmm. um, I also work with folks who um, just have experienced difficulty with dating. Um, and I'm very interested in the idea of goal setting and goal setting apps. Um, and so I've created a program where people can, um, people who are in difficulty dating, um, can, uh, uh, use, um, our platform, uh, or the platform that I've created to, um, to meet their dating goals. So they actually, we sort of have a set. Um, group of different dating goals that people can meet. Um, And then they actually go on. It's really for people who are socially anxious or otherwise just having difficulty in the dating world. Um, Mm -hmm. And so they, you know, they go online, they meet their dating goals, they provide us um, some evidence that they've met their goals. And then once they've met their dating goals, um, they can actually, uh, it's a similar model to way better. So they can actually like win back money from a a larger pool of money. So you can actually Mm -hmm. meet your dating goals and then actually get some money back. Um, But it's amazing. Thank you. So I have a lot of therapists who really like the idea, but I'm having a really hard time. um, And I'm not really advertising savvy. um, So I'm having a really hard time sort of finding um, people to even beta test the site. I think there's emotionally there's a lot of shame around dating. So it, it's so interesting. Um, Lou Lemon was a, you know, some people will say that culture is like a cult. Uh, I, I lived in it for six years and that's not unfair, but, but what it really, what some of the magic is inside is around goal setting and how goal setting really transforms people's lives. 
in any area. And, and it's part of why when you walk into Lululemon, people are, they seem like really happy. And most of the public is like, what do you want? They're on goal setting. So their goals are like up on the wall and it actually transforms lives. So it's so interesting to hear you say that. And then the other thing that's so interesting to hear you say is to be honest about how hard it is to put yourself out there, right? Fundraising and pitching your idea is so freaking personal. It and and the level of rejection that is involved in doing this, like you have to summon the most goat-like version of yourself to get through this. And I'm not joking. Um, because if you were receiving this much rejection in your personal life, like you would stop and go in a different well, direction. It feels a little bit like dating and how people feel with dating. <laughs> that sort of it's thing. like, yeah, the, the rejection level is like wild. And we talk about it in the main class as well. But I mean, thank you for sharing that because what you're saying is like, I'm picking up on a few things. It's like, yeah, it's a really different idea. I've never seen a dating app that is goal orientated. And that might be a refreshing introduction to the scene of just swiping. So people might love it. But when it's new and it's novel, you know, that's often what can gain traction. But so many people won't believe in you because they've never seen that before. Well, nobody saw anything to do with Peloton before, a bike that goes nowhere. And look at that, right? When you've got something really different and innovative, people will reject it, but it can often be the one that hits. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna get more into maybe we'll use we'll come back to some of that when we're teaching. But thank you for that. That's really helpful. And like you're already picking out things that it's like, yeah, we talk about that tonight and we talk about it in the main class, uh, which is running next week. So thank you for that. Um, do we have any, anyone else that's willing to share a little bit about their experience? By the way, let me share one. You know, before I started pitching um, my fund, which is a lot like raising money for a startup, you know, I got the advice of like, you know, uh, do some practice pitching. Uh, I didn't. And as a result, I hope I had meetings with people I hope I never see again in my life. Right. So I've made some of the mistakes. Um, and uh, you will as well. <laughs> Is there anyone else here who has like started their idea or started pitching that's willing to say hi before we start? Hey. Um, hi. Hi. Sorry, hi. I was raising my hand and I was like, maybe I'm not doing this right. <laughs> oh, I couldn't see. I couldn't see. I couldn't that's see. Okay. Okay. Sort of blend in in. the background. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I'm Jen. I am a New York City art educator and uh, illustrator. And I've, I was just curious about this because I've done fundraising, but not in the venture capital type of way. I've done it as in the nonprofit way for school for yeah. projects. I've, you know, written a number of grants and all, all of that stuff. So I was um, additionally a group of us that are affiliated to um, a uh, comic illustration school are looking to start a, pub a publishing um, imprint. And so I thought, well, maybe I can learn something. For sure. You know, um, you know, raising money in the nonprofit world is totally different. Um, I, I suspect from raising it, you know, from venture capitalists for profit and what we learn, and we're going to learn a lot about it tonight is VCs are looking for really, really particular things. Yeah. Um, and there's not a lot of courses out there to tell you what it is. So people spend their lives trying to figure out the mystery of what the VCs are looking for and, and often what angel investors are looking for as well. Um, so this course, like tonight, we'll, we'll get you guys five years ahead. And before we start the course tonight, I'll just say we're going live next week. Um, our, our full course is eight hours, it's 99 bucks. We are a modern education company, accessible to all and affordable to all. And we're kicking off with the full course next week. It's six to 8 p.m. Eastern time, uh, Monday to Thursday night, and we will get you 10 years ahead in what you know. But tonight, let's get started. Um, and, uh, let's dive in. So I want to kick off with, here we go. Um, let's kick off with, uh, number one, we're going to talk about prep before you step. I want you guys to tell me, what do you, what are the four things that you think you should get ready and polished, uh, before you, um, you know, kick off your fundraising round, uh, we're going to talk about deal sequencing. You know, this is a little roadmap of thinking that I wish someone had shown me. Um, again, this is where I had meetings with people I hope I never see again because I just didn't understand the deal sequencing map. Um, number three, where's your money at? Um, when you're raising money, uh, you know, you're know you gonna be hit with some pretty technical terms that we need to learn in the full course. Um, and at the end of the day, there's so much jargon out there, you guys, but 
there's going to be seven things only that really drive your outcome. So I'm going to teach you how to focus on those and what they are. Uh, we're going to talk about inside baseball, mindset and etiquette. You know, I'm going to teach you a few things that you only know. You only know these things that you've actually done it and you've been punched in the face a million times. Um, so I think you'll like some of those things. And I'm going to talk about how VC firms work as well. So if you guys are ready to get started, I am too. Okay. Um, I want to hand it over to you guys. When I tell you there's, and you guys can put it in the chat as well, but pop, pop on the mic if you can. Um, when I tell you guys there's four things that I want you guys to get ready um, and, and make them look polished, and you're, it's probably going to take you about 12 weeks to do it right. Uh, it's a heavy lift. Um, what, what four things do you think I, you know, that I'm thinking about when I say you want to get these four things ready for, for VCs and angels? Um, before you go to get out there and start pitching. What do you guys think those four things are? What would you say? What do you guys think? We've already talked about one. Okay, I'm gonna check the chat. Okay, so we've got uh, elevator pitch for the product. Okay, so Jen, I'm gonna, that's what you said is right. So yeah, Danielle just said it a, a little bit more uh, crisply. So we want to, we were going to call that the pitch deck. Okay. It's going to be about a 20 page deck. Um, and it's going to have really particular things in it that VCs are looking for. So we're going to go into that. So we have your pitch deck. Um, what else do you think you've got to get ready um, before you go out and talk to VCs? So you're looking polished, professional, like you have done this before. Projected figures. Okay. Uh, no data about your product. Okay, yes, but um, that's going to go into the pitch deck. So you said projected figures. Can okay, so Aviva, can you be a little bit more uh, specific? Like projected, how many years forward would you say? Um, anyone know? Uh, five, ten. So I'm going to say, I'm going to call it your five-year forecast. I agree with that. Your five-year forecast. And when I say forecast, what does that really mean? What? Um, what kind of financials are we projecting forward? Anyone know? Okay, so when I say your five-year forecast, it's going to be your uh, your PL or your income statement. So that's going to uh, you know have your top line and your bottom line. So top line meaning revenue, which is what Nancy is saying. So your five-year forecast is going to have five years forward of your income statement, your your cash flow, um, and your balance sheet. Uh, and of course, I, I don't come from investment banking uh, or accounting. So I actually, you actually can hire someone to help you do this. You got to learn, you got to get into it, but you can have someone help you with this. So your pitch deck, your five-year forecast, um, what else, what two other things would you be preparing um, uh, before you kick off your round? One of them investors, actually, no, um, both of them investors may see. So what else? Two other documents here, your pitch deck, your five-year forecast. What else are you preparing before you go out? If I said data room, what do you guys think I mean by your data room? So if I said, I want you to prepare your data room before you go out. Anyone know what that is? Okay, I'm going to show you what a data room is. And then, and then the last one I wanted you guys to guess was your investor target list. Um, so let's get into what all these things really are. Um, let's start with the investor target list. I want you to, um, essentially I'm going to show you my investor target list. And what I want you guys to strongly consider is I want you to do a lot of research, um, before you go out to the market. And I want you to try to identify at least 100 investors that might be interested and you can see there's hundreds of names on here. You can see that there's red, there's green, um, there's no, there's there's even blue. So what I'm doing here, you guys, is I have studied um, the investors who um, invest in uh, in education. I've studied investors who invest in consumer products, direct to consumer um, consumer brands. Uh, I've studied who invests in women. I've got consumer funds here. Um, and so I've scoured the market. If I told you that a lot of what I learned about these VC names and these, um, you know, decision makers here, um, I said I got from Crunchbase, 
Can anyone tell me what Crunchbase is? Does, has anyone used this as a founder? What is Crunchbase? Okay, it is like God's gift to founders. Um, so for example, if I want to find out who invested in General Assembly, which had a strong exit, they were, that was a coding education company, I can go into Crunchbase, which is free for a period. It'll, they'll pay while you eventually, um, but it's only 300 a year. And really every founder uses Crunchbase to raise money. And so I can go into General Assembly and I can see all the way back you know, to the beginning of who invested in them. I can see they got a government grant. Let's see who came into their series A because maybe I should be talking to Jeff Bezos, just kidding. Um, but he, you know, he invests in General Assembly. You've got Learn Capital and you've got Mavron, right? So this is a big consumer fund. This is a big ed tech fund. So Crunchbase is your absolute gift. Um, you know, to I think this is really democratizing fundraising by showing you, you know, who all these investors are and what they invest in. So Crunchbase is gonna be your best friend. And what I do is I'll write down the firm name. I often get it through my networks. I'll write down the decision makers who are what are called the general partners or the GPs. Those are, those are the decision makers in the fund. What is my warm connection? Um, I found emailing investors cold. It has never once worked for me ever. I've never been offered money that way. Um, and so your best bet is to be working through your warm connections on LinkedIn. And this is where it gets like, you gotta, you gotta contact people on LinkedIn that you haven't talked to in 10 years and be like, Hey Beth, I know we haven't talked in 10 years, but I'm going to need you to help me make an introduction. And then you're all the way into the minutia of like, what was the last conversation that you had? Did you send them the deck? Do they read it? What is it? And I know this sounds like minutia, right? And here you know, here is like in red, who, who has said it's too early, right? Who's still talking to me? The reason you need this is to stay super organized on who you've talked to and when, so you don't miss an opportunity. But the crazy thing is, is that if you get a term sheet from a VC in the earliest days, like I did um, for Class Rebel, you know, the, the VC, she said to me, she's like, okay, send me your investor target list. I want to see it. And at first I was like, oh my God, she's going to see the sea of red. Like she's going to see everyone that said no to me, but these VCs have seen it all. And the reason she's asking me for it is because she wants to now roll up her sleeves and help me raise money. And so she doesn't want to go to white star if they've already said no to me, right? She's going to see who I'm missing, you know, who's in her network, who I haven't talked to, and she's going to roll up her sleeves and help me. So not only do you need an investor target list to keep you organized and not missing an opportunity and not forgetting to follow up, um, but great investors will help you go raise money and they're going to want to see this so they don't knock on the same doors as you do. So this is like an absolute must um, to stay organized. And you'll see eventually, you know, once you kick off, you might kick off with 100 names that you research, but it'll quickly turn into 300, you know, as people mobilize to help you get to the right investors and, and open up their network to you. So this is your investor target list. It's just an Excel sheet that I use, um, but it but it works and I use it all the time. Um, the next thing we said was the pitch deck. So let's take a look at that. Um, I wanna show you, I'll just show you Class Rebels pitch deck, modern education company. Um, this is what I would call VC grade. Okay, and it didn't even have this branding on it. It wasn't even this good looking, but I show you this pitch deck because it was offered a VC term sheet um, when it was basically just an idea. We had a few customers. Um, it was mostly just a grand idea. Uh, so when I say there's about 10 things um, that I put in here, uh, what do you think you know, VCs are looking for when you're mostly just an idea? What could you possibly put in this pitch deck and be addressing? that you would be offered, you know, a few million bucks for your like big idea. What is in here, right? Because the more professional it looks and the more you hit on what they're looking for, I think, you know, the more likely you are, you are to open up a door to start building a relationship with a VC. Um, so what do you guys think? What do you think I'd put in this pitch deck um, that I would be offered millions of dollars, you know, for just an idea from a VC in New York? What do you guys think? And you can put it in the chat if you want. 
what what kind of what kind of stuff is in here? Do you think? Anyone know? Anyone want to take a crack at it? Okay. Well, I'll walk you through. Um, you know, the a lot of what people say is like you're you're supposed to open with the problem and the solution. So, you know, what problem are you solving? Uh, and and your company is the solution. And I actually recommend that approach. I think it's a good approach. Um, investors want to know that you're solving a pain point um, for people. Um, and so they want to hear you frame up what's the problem. Now, for us, um, there is another way that you can do it that still will attract um, you know, investors. You instead of framing something as a problem, you can also frame it as an opportunity. And what I would say to investors is um essentially, you know, in this hundred year life, um, the way that culture is constructed is that most of us stop learning at 21 years old. And then that is somehow supposed to serve us the next 80 years until we live to a hundred. And I'm like, I don't, what are we doing for a hundred years or, or the next 80 years past that? Are we doing Netflix and podcasts for 80 years? Like, is this how we're going to live? Right. And I'm like, I don't think so. I think people want modern education but the continuing education out, that's out there is so crusty. It is so uncool. Like you would never put on Instagram that you're doing it. Um, but I think that's just a like absolutely open swim lane for a really modern, cool, you know, continuing education company to come in that's available and affordable to all. So instead of framing continuing education as a problem today, I frame it to investors as this wide open swim lane from 20 years old to 100 that nobody seems to want very much. Um, there's a couple operators in the space, but even they seem pretty crusty to me. So you start off with a problem or solution, um, and then, uh, and then you can go into, or, or you can frame it as the opportunity. Um, the next thing that I usually go into is the product, right? You can't forget to describe what it is you're building. Um, and you're, you'll notice the way that, um, I'm taking investors through is going to go from pretty macro conversation to micro. So investors think macro and micro. And what I mean by that is that they think about industries, right? They think about industries, what's not working anymore, what's stale, where's like the opening, where's the disruption going to come from? So that's, my, that's macro thinking. And then they start to think about, you know, at a micro level about, you know, certain companies and what their position is in the industry. So you'll see in the pitch deck, I'm talking to them about, you know, macro industry opportunity. And then now we're getting into more micro. Okay, and what is my particular company offering? And what I say to them, and I use this, I, I use this language with them because it's their language. I'll say, look, the thesis is this. Um, you know, we're living to 100. We stop learning at 21. There will be a modern education company that comes in and builds really modern courses uh, at a price everyone can afford. Uh, the Netflix or Peloton of education, if you will. Um, and so we get into it. You know, you can learn live. You can do on demand. Uh, we're, we're pay one to 10 forever. Our instructors are from the streets, right? Not the halls of academia. Um, we do recognize, you know, how valuable that is, but there's something about the knowledge from the streets, people that are in it, that are living it every day. That's so valuable. And we think that has been, you know, under marketed and underutilized. Um, and so we talk to investors about how we're starting off with side hustle and wealth, because in this hundred year life, relying on one employer is not going to get you there financially. And we believe this is a big part of why the creator economy has come up, why people are starting startups, why investing has come to the center stage. It's because people are not going to rely on just their job anymore to finance their lives because it doesn't work, not in this hundred year life. And then what we'll say is we'll go on to new, you know, health, family, a whole bunch of modern skill sets after that. Um, but we're starting off with, you know, the, you know, in response to the cultural sentiment that people are looking for ways to finance their lives, this hundred year life outside of just employers. And you can't put everything that you guys want to in a deck. You can't, there's not room for it, but this is where I'll engage investors and say, just like podcasting, just like Gimlet came in in 2014 and said, um, you know, podcasting is going to be a format. People are going to love it. And here's this American life they were dead right. And they were, they kind of kicked off the podcasting industry and they were acquired by Spotify. We're saying we're, there's a market past podcasting. We are the Spotify of, or sorry, we are the Gimlet 
of the of the eight hour live class and we, we one day will be acquired by Spotify. So you can't put everything that you want, um, but you can do a couple pages that explain your product to investors. You might have to keep some things in your back pocket that you wanna say verbally without you know putting everything in the deck because what you can see is I'm trying to cut down on words, right? You wanna hit investors between the eyes. You don't wanna write them a novel. You wanna hit them between the eyes with like pictures if you can, and I'm not joking. How long do you think investors even will read your deck for? Literally, before they decide to give you an, a meeting or not. Anyone know how much time they will spend on, a, on you know something you've slaved over for weeks? Two and a half, three minutes, 10 seconds. Jen, like close, <laughs> um, two minutes. Yeah, two to three minutes is it. So you wanna work with like less text and more pictures. Um, okay, so I'm showing you guys, I've showed you problem solution or you can frame it as opportunity. I've showed you, you know, you gotta, you gotta explain to investors what the product is. Um, what else do you guys think is in here? I saw something else. What else do you guys think is in here? Okay. Um, another thing they're looking for is what's your business model. And when I say what's your business model, that's really a fancy way of saying, um, you know, they're going to say to you, uh, Jen, how does your startup make money? They're not going to say it that way. They're going to say, what's your business model? But what they're really asking is, how do you make money? Right? Because that's the only thing VCs and angels really care about. Um, um, and so you want to talk about, you know, where does your revenue come from? If you get it from direct consumer, like we do, if you get it from employers like Google, like we do, uh, if you get it from, um, you know, education institutions like we do, um, it, you know, investors like to see that you where all your revenue is coming from. And if it naturally fits a subscription, that's a big deal to investors. You want to call that out um, because they love recurring revenue. That's a very nice model to have if it actually fits your business, right? Peloton has recurring revenue. Um, you know, the, the co-working spaces have recurring revenue. Um, you know, every kind of digital fitness has recurring revenue. They also want to see some of your big, bigger cost levers as well. Um, and so when I originally was raising for Class Rebel, I put in this like big New York, you know, live stream studio. This is pre-COVID, obviously. Um, and I actually got a lot of pushback from investors especially in New York, who were salty about what happened with WeWork. They lost lots of money on real estate. And historically, investors do not love upfront real estate investment. So there's a lot of tension around this business model. And now I changed it and I show, you know what? We just, <laughs> we just broadcast from home. It's cool. We don't need a big studio. Um, maybe we can have it in the future. Um, so, you know, they want to know your, your main forms of revenue, where they come from, if you have subscription, and then your, um, and then, some of your big cost levers as well. And if you guys have questions, you can jump in anytime. Um, now, market size, this is a pretty <clears throat> macro conversation. So <clears throat> if, if you feel like it fits the flow, you can put it early uh, earlier in your deck. I, I put it towards the end here because uh, no one was asking me about it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and I think I didn't get asked about it much by investors because you know, the market for what we're doing is obviously like, it's just so big, um, 325 billion. But the point here is that investors are looking for, you know, a market size in the billions and something you can address globally, ideally, because they want to know that the potential return is like commensurate with the risk that they are taking. It is so risky to bet on startups. Most of them fail. So their thinking is like, if we're going to risk on you, Jen, then the market that you're going after has to be huge because you have to have some kind of chance of grabbing a market and actually bringing in about $100 million in five years. And I actually want to go right to that, what I just said, the five-year forecast for a second. Um, you're going to slave over this forecast. You're going to tweak it constantly. But I'll tell you where investors' eyes are really quickly looking if you can tell here is they're looking for basically, um, actually, I just want to clear this. I can see that the, um, this little side thing is up one second. Oops. Hold on clear. Let me stop this for a second. Cause I, yeah, I'm worried that the numbers are too small, but I, oh, damn, whatever. Okay. <laughs> 
um, their, their, their eyes move in like an L shape here. So they're like, okay, is Jen going to track to about a hundred million in five years, right? Is she ambitious? Is she going to go after a big market? And then they, then the eyes move down here and they look at like, okay, well, are her product margins? Um, this is like her snapshot of an income statement. Are her product margins making sense for the industry that she's in? Um, you know, her headcount and marketing as a percentage of sales, does that make sense? But the big thing is down here, does she have a path to profitability? It's okay if Jen wants to show million dollar losses back here or just break even. But you know, you could even show three years straight of losses, but you've got to be having some kind of pathway to profitability and you've got to show that. You can't show five years of losses, investors won't be interested. Um, and you might say to me, like, where you even get, where would you even get these numbers, Brooke? Like they're all made up. Um, and to, to that, I would say, uh, yes, <laughs> that's true. They are. Um, but what you want to do is take your best crack at it, uh, knowing that they're looking for that hundred million, you know, in five years. And we're going to go deeper into this five-year forecast tonight a little bit. Um, any questions so far? I want to stop here because I'm cruising through pretty quick. Any questions or comments so far? Okay. They also want to see, you know, where do you think you sit on the competitive landscape? And, and they want you to do some heavy lifting for them. They don't want to do the research themselves. And, you know, one of the big ones that I would get, Brooke, it, you know, they'd say, Brooke, well, how are you different from masterclass? And you got to be ready for these competitive questions. And what I would say is, you know, um, we love Masterclass. We share their thesis that education is a consumer product worthy of a consumer experience and a consumer brand. But uh, the biggest distinction between us and Masterclass is that they are actually mostly an entertainment company. That's how they speak about themselves inside. Uh, and we're an, actually an education company. Um, you know, they just released a course called Real Estate Investing. And, you know, they don't even talk about a, a, an agreement of purchase and sale. They don't talk about mortgages, like they're more an inter entertainment company, whereas we will try and entertain you in our courses, but we go deep. We do not produce a course unless you are moved 10 years ahead in what you know. So it's an entertainment versus education. We're also live. Um, so you can actually share your experience like people are doing tonight. You can ask your questions of the instructor. You can hear other people's questions, which are so valuable. And you can actually meet other people. We hope you meet the love of your life. And I'm not joking. I'm not joking. We hope people meet on here. Um, so that's competitive advantage. Here's a big one, use of proceeds, right? What are you going to do with the money that you raise? And, you know, when I first went out to raise money for a class rebel, my first line item, you know, I'd had this at two and a half million. My first line item, you guys, was like, I was going to spend a million and a half on real estate, you know, making this like Soho house meets Peloton studio with like cameras on the roof. And they were like, no you are not spending a million and a half of investor money on like pillows and cushions and mill work, like do this online. So they really didn't like it. Obviously I've changed my model as a result. Um, and so they're going to have a point of view of how you're spending your money. Brooke, why are you spending so little on course creation? Because it's actually, this is a very high margin business. Uh, it doesn't cost that much to create. So use of proceeds, how are you going to spend investor money in the first you know, couple of years? And then this is the big one, guys, the team. Um, I will say that I was given a term sheet as a solo female founder, but that's not very common. Um, you know, they like to see teams, uh, with complementary skill sets. And actually we're going, our team is going back to raise again. And we have a full suite of chief growth officer, chief education officer, and chief, um, product officer. Uh, but I actually didn't raise money that way. I wasn't, I was offered a term sheet with much less than that just folks that came from consumer and brand backgrounds. Um, but ideally you want a complimentary team. Um, the founder of the Honest Com or the CEO of the Honest Company, who I knew from my fun days said to me, he's like, Brooke, he's like, I think your idea is dead on. But he said, I will invest in a great team with a mediocre idea before I invest in a great idea with no team. And I was like, okay, be right back, be right back. Let me find my team. Um, so this to him wasn't enough. I needed to find my chief education, chief growth and chief product officer, and we'll come back. 
Um, and then they want to, they'll say to you, okay, um, Jen, when the money's in the bank, they'll say, what's your go to market? Uh, and what they mean is like, once the money hits the bank, how fast can you get up and running? Uh, and so here I'm showing them, you know, we can get up and running in seven months. We can produce enough courses to get people on subscription um, and away we go. Um, someone in the chat said, you know, uh, I think data-driven visuals. Yeah, to the extent you actually have some data, I think it helps. And this is actually an old deck. We're redoing our deck with, because we have much more data, uh, like, you know, a year later. Um, but any traction uh, that you've had to date, you know, this is all very old, what you're looking at. Um, you know, any traction you've had to date, any like uh, marketing insights, any customer behavior insights um, that you have is, is helpful for investors to know uh, what you've learned and what you're doing. Okay, I'm conscious of time. Um, so uh, we only have about 15, 20 minutes left. Um, before we move on, any questions about this deck? I will say there's, this has been given a lot of branding. Uh, my first deck that I actually got a term sheet on, I, it like didn't look like this. It had all this information, but it wasn't as like good looking. Um, it looked like Canva did it because that's what I used. So it wasn't great. It doesn't have to be. Just has to have the right information. Any other, qu any questions on this? The last thing I'll say is, um, you know, your five-year forecast is something, if you don't come from an investment banking or accounting background, you know, you're going to want to get help with. Um, this is a five-year, you know, p income statement forecast. I don't want you to, you know, you see a lot of numbers, a lot of lines here. All I want you to get from what I'm showing you today is that the first person that you need to prove to that this business is going to make money in five years is yourself. You do not want to be struggling away for a business that doesn't even make money at scale. A lot of food businesses have very, very thin margins, right? Bakeries, things like this. Um, not to say it can't be done, but it's something you really have to look at because some of these businesses really um, rely on volume. At Class Rebel, you know, with our courses for the for the quality that we teach, charging only ninety nine, we only survive with scale. We only survive at that price with lots of people coming. Um, and so you want to take a good hard look. I mean, I have like you know down to when I had real estate in the model, I had down to like how much does it take a cost a month to get the garbage collected or the place, the physical location clean. Like I want you to think about every little thing so that you can prove to yourself that this makes money. It's going to put you in a great position to answer investor questions when they start drilling you. And it's a good sign if they want to look at this forecast and ask you questions. You, you've moved to basically the next stage of diligence if investors are actually digging around uh, in your five-year forecast. Okay. Um, I won't say much about the data room tonight. Um, I think we'll leave that, you know, if you can join me in the main class, whoops, because uh, we've got a few other things to cover before we end. Um, but just to round up, these are the four things you got to prepare before you go and raise. A um, couple things I'll say about the sequencing. You know, this is really important to have, you know, this mental map in your head because it's how angel investors think and it's how VCs think. Um, and I want to start by describing the seed series because, you know, I've been doing this for 10 years and I would say this pre-seed language only popped up a, a few years ago, really. Um, so starting with the, the seed series, what it means to raise your seed round is typically you're a pre-revenue company, you know, or you might call it beta stage revenue, uh, way less than 2 million or 1 million a year. You may have like, you know, a couple grand a month, like you're brand new, right? And the people that come in here are like very high risk, very high reward investors. Uh, these are the people that believe in you and nobody else does. And you're usually cobbling it together you know, maybe uh, 1 million, 2 million, somewhere in this range, um, you know, 25 grand check here, 50 grand check here, 100 grand check here. And it's usually from family and friends and angels. And the legal format that we go way deeper to, into in class is you're going to raise it on a convertible note or a safe. Um, we definitely don't have time in class tonight to get into the deal mechanics of the note and the safe, but it, but if you join us next week, it is a this is a must know. 
uh, for how these work, because this is this involves you giving up a lot of your company right now for the money that you're taking. So you need to know, you know, how to keep as much as you can for the money that you're taking. So you have to learn about these legal instruments to take money on, you know, investors give you the money, you provide them with a copy, a physical copy of the note or the safe. And it's usually family and friends, you know, the press loves to write when VCs are leading, you know, the initial first rounds. Um, but a lot of what happens in the press is like the more sensational stuff. Usually a founder is like scraping and scrapping for years, just getting small checks to like make it to the next step. So that's the seed round. And um, the only the only difference that I can see between a pre-seed and a seed is the amount of money right here. So, you know, the company is still pre-revenue or beta revenue. They, they raise money from the angels on a note or a safe. Uh, and it really is, you know, because it's only like a, a couple hundred grand, you don't see VCs at a, at a pre-seed stage because the, the check size is too low. They, they have, you know, certain amounts of capital they have to move out the door. Um, and to, to put a live example of, on this, you know, when I was first raising for Class Rebel, when I had the New York, when I had the real estate and the model, I was raising two and a half million. And I called that a, I called that a seed round, right? Because it was in this range, two and a half million. When I called off the raise, because I felt like the real estate was too, there's too much tension around that. I put it down for a minute, COVID hit, and I quickly came back to the market and raised about 110 grand. And I called that a pre-seed, but I did it on a safe, right? Um, so when you hear pre-seed and seed, the real distinction I, I, I think is that pre-seed means, you know, you're just raising like first dollars in just a couple hundred grand just to get some prototypes made or just some foundational investments to get moving and get your sales moving. Series A, on the other hand, is, you know, if you're raising a Series A round, you usually have revenue at this point, um, or you have like millions of users on your app or whatever it is. Um, but usually there's like two to seven million in revenue at this point. It's been de-risked in a way. So you still see family and friends and angel investors, but a lot more VCs are going to come in at the Series A stage. Why do you guys think? Why do you guys think VCs come in here? I mean, more and more, they're coming in early, but you're gonna get way more at the Series A stage. What are you guys saying? Because it's a safer bet, exactly, Jen. Like it's been de-risked in a sense by proving that there's customers and revenue for what this company is doing. And so the reality is uh, that you will experience is that you know for every one investor, for for every one angel that says, Jen, you know, we love what you're doing. We, we don't, we're not looking around what any other investor is doing. We're giving you our money. We believe in you and your idea. For every one of those, I swear to God, there's like 90 to like 100 of them being like, Jen, thank you for pitching us. We love you, your team, great idea, but you're just too early for us. They will have known that from the moment you started pitching, but they'll want to hear and they, they'll want to stay close. But most VCs are going to say you're too early. And they're going to wait out until this stage until you're de-risked. Uh, and so there's an interesting dynamic and, and, you know, how angel investors will get treated uh, favorably for coming in early, which we talk about in the main class. We need to learn a new deal structure. Um, in this case, you're going to take money on, on what's called a, a priced round or convertible preferred shares. We've got to get way more into that in the, in the main class. Um, but this time you're going to raise like usually between two and 10 million, 5 million is pretty common, you know, target size for your raise. Of course, the press is going to report like 25 million series A, like these big ones, but 5 million is pretty standard. And you're going to have these mix, um, you know, of angels and VCs from here, you know, series B and C and D you're using, you know, the, the same preferred de deal type all the time. So we'll learn that once. Uh, but we actually need to learn three different deal types for you guys to get comfortable with. One, two, and three. Any questions about, and this is just high level. In, in our main course, we come back to this like every single night. There's lots more to say on this, but this is high level, you know, the mental map that every investor and angel investor in BC has in their head. So I want the founders to as well. 
Okay. Okay. Um, in the nine minutes we have left, can I ask you guys, um, if I asked you what a pro forma cap table was, would you know? Or would, does anyone want to take a crack at telling me what a pro forma cap table is? What do you guys think? Anyone know a pro forma cap table? Okay, so a pro forma cap table is a tool that every sophisticated VC uses, every angel uses, and every experienced founder uses. And in our main course, we're gonna look at it. I'm gonna give you one, we work with it. And the pro forma cap table is a tool that everyone uses to compute, you know, for the money as a founder, you're going to take how much money uh, do you, you know, or how much percentage of your company do you predict giving up? If you're going to take a million and a half, you know, on a certain instrument, on a certain valuation, what does that mean? Are you giving up 10% of your company, 25%, 40%? Like, how do you know, right? So the pro forma cap table is this tool both investors and founders use to predict everyone's percentage outcome for the money that is given to the company to grow. And what we learn by practicing with that pro forma cap table is out of all the jargon you guys are going to hear in the VC world, there's seven things that matter. And so we're going to learn in the main course, I'm going to prove to you with the numbers, why as a founder, when you're raising money on a note or a safe, it's called the valuation cap. That is the number one thing that matters to you. It's the number one thing that you're going to be negotiating uh, with the investors. We're going to learn other terms. You guys might have heard of like the discount rate and the interest rate. Yes, those are there. They're terms of the deal that we're going to learn, but they do not affect your outcome as strongly as the valuation cap does. And so we need to learn what that is and whether you want it higher or lower. Um, similarly here, there's five things on your series A type deal that if you're not focused on this, if you, if something gets by you, or you don't think this is important, you're going to end up giving up more of your company that you should have. And trust you, me, VCs don't have, I mean, <laughs> I'm on recording, but like investors won't hesitate to take advantage of, um, founders lack of understanding of this stuff. Most angels and VCs understand this stuff inside out. And a lot of founders don't. And there's a real informational informational asymmetry that is to the benefit of investors. And I've seen founders get taken advantage of. Um, so we need to learn this stuff so that you know, right, what the right things are to like laser focus on. It's these seven things, but I proved that to you in the main course with our, it's called a pro forma cap table. Um, I'm loving this slide because you only know this if you've done it and gotten every punch to the face. So the number one thing I can tell you about raising money when it comes to mindset and etiquette is raising money in my experience is about building relationships and relationships are built over time. You are not going to walk in to someone you've never known, do your beautiful pitch with your beautiful pitch deck and have them commit on the spot. It rarely happens. What's going to happen is you're going to pitch them once um, and then you're going to try and find your way in to get another meeting within two weeks. In that time, you want to show them some progress. Oh, Google just signed up for a class package with Class Rebel, right? Now we have Google as a corporate client. Oh, um, you know, Shopify, their group of angel investors are going to sign up, you know, in a, in a class package, right? So you always want to, you know, you want to get and do your pitch, but you want to set up that second meeting and keep that relationship going. When I got my term sheet in New York, uh, I'd met with that VC. She asked to meet with me like six or seven times before she committed. And when I was raising for my fund, same deal. Like not a single person committed on the spot unless unless they had a previous relationship with one of the partners. So it, this is about building relationships. You have to pitch people multiple times and give them you know new tidbits of information for them to basically come around and invest in you is what I found. Um, you most certainly want to road test your pitch on your friends, your customers, your family, because the dirty secret is, is that your friends and family will poke the same holes in your pitch uh, that the VCs will. And by road testing it ahead of time, um, you get a chance to articulate your answer so that you don't stumble. 
So before I pitched Class Rebel to any professional investor, angel or VC, I road tested our deck on 25 Class Rebel customers, right? So I already knew what the um, weak points were and I could fix them before I went. Um, and I also I could articulate answers about competition, right? And why we're different. Um, I think, you know, you want to put down the, the, the pedal on, on pitch, uh, on, on fundraising here and get in and out of the market as fast as you can. Um, you know, I like to say aim for 12 weeks, close what you can and just start building, um, so that you, you know, your company doesn't get stale. Um, I think what a lot of founders do is that the, um, the rejection of fundraising is so uh, personal that I've seen a lot of founders just stop and they take a break. They go back to their business because that's their first love. And the next thing you know, their their fundraising is dragging on for nine months and no one's committing because it's sort of been chopped around and it's a small investment community. Um, do or do not, there is no try. Um, you know, your attitude will impact your outcome. And it's really hard to, you know, when I was raising a fund, it was really hard for me to say, you know, that I was a money manager and that, that I was a GP when we weren't even managing money. It's like, you have to carry yourself, like, like what you've built is already in existence going with or without them, right? You know, we're not trying to build something. You're not hoping to build something. Like you are building something. The train is leaving the station. This is their invitation to come aboard. And that is a hard posture to adopt for a lot of people. It certainly is for me because sometimes it feels like I'm lying but like, or I'm not being told, you know, there's, there's a cognitive dissonance, you know, um, with, you know, behaving like this is happening with or without investors, but it, you know, investors are reading your confidence level. And, um, I think that they need to know that you're building this with or without them, their particular dollars doesn't matter. Uh, the money is green, um, which is what a lot of other founders have said to me. Um, Renting names is one of the most successful fund raising strategies that I know of, and I used it to raise 32 million for my fund on the first try. Uh, does anyone know what I mean by renting names? What would you guys say that even means? Okay, with two minutes left, what it means is that people from an industry that, are, that have already been successful ahead of you are backing you. So when I raise my fund, to invest in new consumer concepts, I had I had 50 CEOs and founders and executives from the retail industry, 35 of them from Lululemon, which is one of the most successful apparel startups to date. Now it's 20 years old, it's not a startup, but it's a very successful apparel company. And so, you know, I had, you know, all the top executives backing me. And so that was basically renting names. If they're backing me and they know what they're doing and they're successful, then that drew other capital to me. Um, the founder of Outdoor Voices did this. Um, you know, most, many, many startups do this, renting names. Try and find some early investors that have been already successful years ahead of you in a similar space because it adds credibility to you that you don't have yet. Um, the last thing I'll say, and then we'll, then we'll high five and call it a class, is um, essentially this. When you're raising money, you want to talk, you want to be talking to the decision maker. You, I wouldn't spend more than 30 minutes talking to anyone with the title of associate analyst principal, um, anyone either than the GPs or the MDs they're called uh, in a VC firm or the angel himself or herself, because these folks down here, principal associate, these are gatekeepers of the GP's time. They're deal vetters, they're deal sources, and they're also gonna happily compare your information against a competitor. So when I, if I ever get, you know, uh, I, I try and get introduced at the top level. If I do get kicked down to an associate, I'll give them 30 minutes. That's it. Be very nice about it. But I'll say, hey, you know, at the end of the meeting, I'll be like, hey, do you think you have the pull to get me a meeting with Steve? What do you think? Right. And I'll put them right on the spot to, to elevate me to the GP level so that I can actually get in front of a decision maker. You guys, that's my class. Um, I'll just end by saying uh, we are doing the full class next week. Uh, Monday to Thursday night, 6 to 8 p.m. It's $99. Uh, pay one to 10 forever. We're also recording and we will move you 10 years ahead in what you know about this and set you up for success. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you so much, Brooke. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brooke. Thanks, guys. See ya. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Hina. Thank Good you. Night. Bye, everyone.
Thank you.